This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. In the late 1980s, South Korea and Seoul were having a moment. Its economy was on fire, exporting cars and electronics at a rapid pace. The Korean cultural wave was just about to begin, which now broadcasts K-pop to the world. Seoul hosted the Summer Olympics in 1988, shining a spotlight on the city and country. The event made it clear that its airport, Gimpo International, was not large enough to handle the increased tourism and business traffic. Seoul needed a new airport. But where? All of the parcels of land large enough to host an airport were far from the city center. There was another option. Create new land in the Yellow Sea. Despite the cost and other drawbacks, authorities decided to build a new airport on reclaimed land between the two islands just off of mainland Korea and Incheon. The land between the two islands was shallow, and after nine years of construction, the Seoul metro area had phase one of its new airport. Opening in 2001, the airport is consistently rated as one of the best in the world. Its annual passenger traffic puts it in the top 20 globally. Incheon International Airport seems like a major win and a great example of how land reclamation can help a city grow and thrive. It's a practice that has gone on for centuries. Boston Harbor, for example, has completely changed throughout the years. It's almost unrecognizable between the 1600s and today. But is it all positive? What are the drawbacks to land reclamation? And why have some cities begun to prohibit it? In this video, we'll weigh the pros and cons and examine how land reclamation has literally shaped coastal cities all over the world. Okay, before we can understand the costs and benefits of adding land to a city, I think it's helpful to understand the process itself. The physical process of land reclamation is pure engineering, something outside the field of planning. Rather than me explain something pretty far outside my area of expertise, I asked an actual expert to explain it instead. Let's hear Grady from the popular channel Practical Engineering give it a shot. Thanks, Dave. Land and sea seem like opposites, or at least they do on a map. In reality, the shoreline is a pretty arbitrary divider. It's just the location where the top of the water happens to touch the ground, and we can alter the shoreline, creating, aka reclaiming, land where there was sea by adding more soil. Dumping dirt into the ocean seems simple enough. Dense soil particles easily displace the water, especially if there are a lot of them. But there are a few engineering challenges with land reclamation to overcome. The first one being, where do you get all that soil? Such a significant change on the landscape requires enormous amounts of fill. Most reclamation projects happen in urban areas, so sources of nearby soil in such extreme quantities are usually in short supply. That means most reclamation projects borrow sand dredged from the ocean bed itself. This borrow source has to be nearby because of the second challenge with land reclamation. Soil is heavy. It's no small feat to move millions of tons of anything from one place to another. Excavators and barges can do it, but it would take a heck of a lot of diesel fuel. That's why most land reclamation projects these days use hydraulic fill, a method of mixing a slurry of water and soil so it can be pumped in pipes instead of carried. But once your fill is in the right place, that doesn't mean your job is done. Presumably you're creating land so you can build something on top. That means your new territory needs to serve as a strong foundation. Ground improvement methods like vibratory compaction and even temporarily overfilling the land to add more weight help make sure your property won't settle over time. Ignoring the environmental, legal, and financial challenges, that's how you create land from the sea. Back to you, Dave. Thanks, Grady. Very helpful. As you can tell, land reclamation is not a trivial thing. It requires a true demand for new land and a lack of viable alternatives, and the financial resources to make it possible. Land reclamation is particularly common in Asia, a region known for its rapid urbanization over the last few decades. Cities along China's coast added 700 square kilometers of land per year between 2006 and 2010. 700 square kilometers is about the size of Singapore. This is due in part to China's land use policies. China strictly protects arable land to ensure an adequate food supply for its 1.4 billion people, which means that if cities want to grow, they often have to grow into the sea where no arable land protections exist. Let's look at one prominent project, Shanghai's Pudong International Airport. The first phase began in 1997, and throughout the years it slowly grew into the Yangtze River estuary. 
It gets even crazier when you zoom out a little. Shanghai didn't just expand for the airport, but they added an entirely new district. Shanghai added 580 square kilometers of land since 1985, and it's still growing. This new area called Nanhui New City will house 450,000 people when it's complete. It's also home to eight university campuses that enroll over 100,000 students. You can see their logic. It would be hard to find hundreds of kilometers of land within close proximity to the urban center, particularly with those strict land use controls. So instead, they just built into the sea. The pressure to find new land is even greater in countries and districts without much land to begin with. Macau, a former Portuguese colony and current special administrative region in China, is the most densely populated region in the world, with triple the density of nearby Hong Kong. Increasing the already high density in Macau isn't a great option to accommodate growth, so land reclamation becomes a viable option. Currently, Macau consists of only 33 square kilometers of land. Here it is next to Manhattan to give you a sense of scale. But the Macau of today is three times larger than the Macau of 200 years ago, when it was only 10 square kilometers. We don't have aerial photography from 200 years ago, but you only have to go back 36 years to see massive changes. As the years progress, you can see significant filling in in this part of southern Macau. The new district, Kotai, used to be all sea, and this part of Macau used to be two separate islands, like the airport in Seoul. The new land is currently full of casinos. But by far the most prominent additions in Macau have been the two new islands in the northeast. The largest island is a massive border checkpoint for the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, the largest bridge causeway tunnel combination in the world. The other nearby island will host nearly 60,000 people, with commercial, industrial, and tourist districts. Macau is only one microdistrict or city state engaging in land reclamation. Singapore and Hong Kong have also engaged in significant projects to continue their growth while adhering to their existing borders. There's another type of land reclamation that I need to mention, but it can only be described as Dubai. In the early 2000s, Dubai's real estate market was hot, and the small emirate looked to the sea to add new land to sell to developers and investors. The most famous addition to the Dubai shoreline is the Palm Jumeirah, a series of islands that resembles a palm tree. Individual houses line the palm fronds, with larger resorts built along its protective barrier islands. There's a monorail that runs up and down the spine. Despite the relative success of Palm Jumeirah, Dubai's land reclamation is mostly a cautionary tale. Land reclamation projects are expensive and time-consuming, and it can be easy to miss the window of opportunity. After the 2008 global financial crisis, the market for luxury properties on islands shaped like palm trees dried up. The nearby Palm Jebel Ali had finished its land reclamation, but to date, no development has started. Palm Dero is going to be the largest Palm Island project, and you can see on Google Maps that land reclamation got started, but was never finished. Dubai's developers, Nakhil Properties, is now marketing them as Dira Islands and not planning on finishing the palm shape. The World Islands, an archipelago meant to resemble the Earth, also stalled out. There are only a few islands that have been developed, and most sit empty, slowly eroding away. The channels between them have already begun silting up in spots. There's a great video on this that I'll link to in the description. Dubai demonstrates how land reclamation can completely change the coastline of a major city but it also comes at a cost. The biggest cost is environmental. Land reclamation results in the destruction of natural habitats, often tidal marsh ecosystems. They are extremely efficient organic carbon sinks, or areas that absorb more carbon than they release, making them helpful in our fight against runaway carbon emissions. Tidal marshes also protect urban areas from flooding and erosion, and offer habitats necessary for some commercially caught fish species. Replacing these critical habitat zones with reclaimed land, particularly land covered with concrete and asphalt, eliminates these benefits and can make cities more susceptible to large storms, sea level rise, and other negative effects of climate change. Singapore, for example, has eliminated 95% of its coastal mangrove habitat. The swamps now only account for 0.5% of the country's land area. China has lost over half of its coastal wetlands and seen an 80% drop in coral reefs. There is evidence that eliminating these natural flood and erosion control systems, well, results in more flooding and erosion. One study found that man-made land reclamation actually makes flooding worse in other non-reclaimed areas by making high tides higher. This is the sort of thing marshes, wetlands, and swamps can help mitigate. 
This is also an important finding because some advocate for using land reclamation as a way of protecting coastal cities from sea level rise. You just reclaim a bunch of land along the coast, but build the land higher than it was before, and you have a seawall and new land for skyscrapers. Two birds with one stone. But the problem is that preventing flooding in one place can cause flooding in others, and it can be difficult to predict these sort of impacts. And they aren't all good. And the argument that land reclamation projects can protect cities from sea level rise doesn't always hold water, particularly if the reclaimed land is sinking. One study of major land reclamation projects in Asia found that many of them are sinking through a process called subsidence. According to this study, the airport project in Seoul is experiencing some of the worst subsidence. It's sinking at a rate of about 25 centimeters per year. Shanghai Pudong Airport is sinking about 10 centimeters per year. This kind of sinking means that land reclamation may not be a reliable way of protecting cities from rising seas. These environmental costs mean that using land reclamation to grow a city is not an easy decision to make. Some view land reclamation as a necessary evil, while others believe the environmental costs are not worth the benefits. Zhejiang province in China, just south of Shanghai, has instituted a ban on land reclamation and enacted a policy to ensure at least 35% of its coastline remains natural. This is just one of several recent Chinese policy changes meant to protect habitat, a significant change from the country's previous development-first mindset. Elsewhere in Asia, however, land reclamation continues, and we'll be redrawing maps of these megacities for years to come. So what do I think about land reclamation? For that discussion, you have to head over to Nebula. Nebula is a streaming video service created by me and my fellow YouTubers like Lindsay Ellis, Wendover Productions, Knowing Better, and Polyphonic. Nebula is the place to watch videos ad-free and get all sorts of exclusive content. That means over on Nebula, this ad was replaced by me talking about land reclamation. You can also check out other great Nebula original series like Tom Scott's Money, a game theory game show that pits some of your favorite YouTubers against each other to win Tom Scott's Money. I also have a couple of Nebula original videos you may also be interested in too. Nebula is great and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high quality engaging documentaries. They host thoughtful content, we host thoughtful content on Nebula, and now you can get them together for one super low price. If you go sign up to CuriosityStream using the link in the description below, you get Nebula for free. It's not a free trial, it's free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they have a great promotion going on right now. An annual plan is 26% off. That's less than $15 a year for CuriosityStream and Nebula. You'll be able to watch nature documentaries narrated by David Attenborough, as well as my original video on the history of the city of Rome on Nebula. Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel, as well as the dozens of other great YouTubers working to make Nebula a success. It's really an overall good deal too, so click on the link in the description to get 26% off. Thanks.